Good evening. I'm Mr. Barrett, one of the characters in the Molo, Mole Mystery Theater, which follows right away. I just want to remind you that although next winter seems very far away, right now is the time to do something about next winter's heating problem. The government says that fuel of all types is going to be scarce, so if you want to keep warm, you should go to your dealer now and get whatever kind and quantity of fuel he can let you have. Also, you should check up on all your heating equipment and make sure that you're not wasting fuel. And lastly, protect your home against loss of heat by installing insulation and weather stripping. Those are the ways in which you can protect your home against next winter's cold. And now, the Mole Mystery Theater, presented by M-O-L-L-E. Mole, the brushless shaving cream that guards your tender skin with its special protective film. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Jeffrey Barnes welcoming you to the program that presents the best in mystery and detective fiction. Tonight we bring you an unusual tale of the supernatural by Oliver Onions entitled The Beckoning Fair One. It is a gripping study in human terror, the eerie story of a strange rebellion and the terrible consequences that followed. So here it is, The Beckoning Fair One. My name is Paul Oleron. I'll tell it from the beginning, just the way it happened. I don't ask you to believe it. Just listen. I was working on my new novel, Romilly, when I decided to move. I looked over a couple of places and finally discovered one I liked. Of course, it's not a new house, Mr. Oleron, but we'll do the place over for you any color you like. They're certainly quaint-looking rooms, aren't they? Plenty of atmosphere here. <laughs> you writers will have your atmosphere. Uh-huh. Uh, are you sure you won't reconsider about uh, taking the whole house, I mean? Mm. Hey, you never know who might rent the other floors, you know. Well, if you don't mind my saying so, Mr. Barrett, you're not likely to have many people interested in living in this old relic. Oh, it's not as bad as all that. But I rather like the idea of being the only tenant in this venerable mansion. Huh? just as you like, Mr. Oleron. Leave it to me, Mr. Barrett. I'll make my corner of it cozy enough. <laughs> I was thoroughly pleased with my new quarters. There was an air of ancient charm about the place that appealed to my imagination. Then I discovered the handle in the window seat. That meant there was a box underneath. But the lid was stuck. I went to work on it with mallet and chisel. Paneling rang and vibrated. The whole house seemed to echo. Finally, I loosened the lid and tried it out. I drew out something soft and yielding, covered with dust. It was some kind of a large bag, triangular in shape. It had wide flaps and buckles. I couldn't imagine what it had been used for. Soon lost interest in it, depositing it in a corner of the room. Then I set about removing a large nail from the bottom of the lid. Uh, I spent the rest of the afternoon putting my manuscripts into the box. In the evening, Elsie Bengo paid me a visit. Elsie worked on a newspaper, and she was always enthusiastic over my work, especially the new novel, Ronald. Well, Elsie, what do you think of the place? Oh, I don't know, Paul. I like the last place. In spite of the black ceiling and no water tap. How's Romley coming? Uh... Not very well. Are you stuck? Yep. Can't seem to get on with it. Paul, would you like to read me some of it? You don't understand, Elsie. I haven't done any more on it. Not a line. Paul, you're joking. Ah, perfectly serious. I'm even considering scrapping the whole 15 chapters and starting over. Making Romilly a different type of woman. You mean you're really going to scrap those 15 chapters? You seem more concerned about it than I am. Well, maybe I am. You've got what you've been working for almost within your reach. A novel that'll make you famous. You still have a lot of confidence in Romilly, don't you? And now you just want to scrap the whole thing. Paul, it's unforgivable. Oh, what's the difference, Elsie? 
The important thing is I'm happier here than I've been for a long time. I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to let you. It's just that... But I feel so close to Romney. Paul, what's this thing in the corner here? Suppose you tell me. Why, it's a harp cover. It's what? It's a harp cover. It's been used to wrap up a harp before putting it into its case. Oh, it must be a very old one. Oh, thanks for solving my mystery. Paul? Hmm? Paul, who lives in the rest of this house? Nobody. I'm the only tenant. Paul? Yes? May I tell you frankly what I feel about this place? By all means. You'll never work here. <laughs> why on earth not? I don't know why. But you'll never finish Romilly here. <laughs> That night, I sat by my fire, pondering over Elsie's prophecy. I looked around the room. It filled me with a sense of calm I'd never known before. The more I thought about Elsie Bengo, the more I became convinced I would have to destroy those 15 chapters. Unwittingly, I'd put too much of Elsie into my character of Romilly. And those qualities I disliked in Elsie Bengo... I found objectionable in Romilly. Then I became aware of the dripping water tap in the kitchen. It had a tinkling range of three notes on which it seemed to play a tune. In my mind's eye, I could see the gathering of each drop, a little tremble on the lip of the tap, and the tiny musical sound of its fall. I found myself waiting to hear each drop over and over again. Oh, uh, come in. Good morning, Miss Oberon. That was a nice sleep. Oh, the best, Miss Grayson, the best. You sure I'm not putting you out any, asking you to come over every morning and get my breakfast? Oh, huh? I don't mind it a bit. What's a caretaker's wife for if not to take care of things? <laughs> <laughs> da, ba, ba. Da, da. Dear me, but that's a very old tune, Miss Oberon. I haven't heard it in these 40 years. Hmm? What tune? Oh, the one you come in. It's called the Beckon and Fair one. Really? Uh, sing it for me. <laughs> Dear me, I haven't got any voice, but if you want, it went something like this. Very, very pretty. <laughs> they do say it was sung to a harp. The tune must be at least a hundred years old. And uh, and I was humming it? <laughs> Indeed you were. Huh. This is odd. I, I thought I heard that tune last night, dripping from the kitchen faucet. <laughs> uh, Silly idea. A faucet singing. As time passed, I became more and more attached to my apartment. But Elsie Bengo did not share my enthusiasm. It just doesn't belong to today at all, Paul. You no, know, this is a dead house. Everything in it reeks of decay. That's all in the point of view, isn't it, Elsie? Is Romilly coming any better? I think she is. I'm laying the foundations of her new character. I'll begin the actual writing soon. You mean you discarded the old Romilly? Yes. Oh, where's the manuscript? In the window box. What do you want it for? I want to read you something. Bring you back to your senses. Maybe you hear someone else read. What's the matter, Elsie? Nothing. I just cut my finger. You ought to take that nail out of the lid, Paul. But I thought I did. Oh, oh here, let me bandage it. Please don't worry about it, Paul. It's running over scratch. Look, would you walk me down to the bus? It'll do you good to get out for a breath of fresh air. I, I can't, Elsie. I really must get down to work. No. No, that isn't why you won't go out. Oh, Paul, move out of here. 
Everything's wrong with this place. Now, Elsie, please. Here, uh, let me see you to the door. Huh? My foot through. Oh, you poor girl. <laughs> it's so funny. Elsie. <laughs> Elsie. First this nail and now this step. Oh, oh, Lord, it's so funny. Elsie, let me help you. No. No, don't let me go. Elsie. Please, please let me go away. I'm not wanted here. <laughs> Alone that night before my fireplace, I found myself considering Elsie's two accidents. I thought I'd removed that nail from the lid of the window box. But then I couldn't be too certain I hadn't left a bit of it still in the wood. And the staircase was an old one. Though it seemed strong enough to me, the step might have collapsed under anybody. Poor Elsie simply happened to be the victim. My imagination was beginning to play tricks with me. I actually fancied I heard my name in the sound of the dripping water tap. <laughs> I, I laughed at myself. That's what came of too much thinking. Suddenly, I stopped laughing. I heard a rustling sound. It seemed to be coming from the center of the room. For a moment, I couldn't identify it. It's a long, sweeping sound. A faint cracking in it. What is it? What's there? Who's there? That sound. It's a woman combing her hair. I've got to get out of here. I fled the house. I walked for hours in the cold, clear night. Gradually, my fear left me. I began to laugh at myself. Well, of course I hadn't removed that nail. Of course the wood in that step had been rotted through. As for the invisible woman brushing her hair, I'd been dreaming too much, that was all. It was morning by the time I got back to the house. I hadn't been to bed at all. I was tired. I found Mrs. Grayson, the caretaker's wife, waiting for me in my room. Took the liberty of coming in, Mr. Oran, seeing as the door was open and you weren't home. I've, I've been out for a walk. You needn't bother about breakfast this morning, Miss Grayson. I'm not hungry. From now on, Mr. Oran, you'll have to make other arrangements for getting your breakfast. What? I won't be setting foot inside your door again. Well, why? What's the matter? I'm a respectable woman, and I'll not be serving a man who makes a habit of entertaining ladies in his room. Ladies? I'll make your bed for you this last time. Make up my bed? That's a good one. I, I haven't been to bed yet. I haven't been here all night. No. Well, somebody spent the night here, Mr. Oleron, because your bed's been slept in. Well, mystery fans, do you think Paul Oleron's house is really haunted? Or is he bewitched by his own imagination? And is there anything he can do to save himself? Uh, yes, Mr. Barnes, there is. Listen to me. I was once bewitched, but I was saved by a magic word. A magic word? What word? Now listen, my face was bewitched. Every time I shaved, I used to get invisible little nicks and scrapes. But then I learned the magic word. Mole! <laughs> well, gentlemen, there is something magical about the way Mole protects your face against irritating little nicks and scrapes. But there's a common sense reason behind it. You see, Mole has a special protective film, a slick, smooth, moist film with more real body and substance than light, fluffy cream. Mole gives your razor something to ride on. Your razor rides along smoothly from the first stroke to the last without pulling or tugging at your whiskers. And then 
your tender skin gets the very best of protection against aftershave burn and irritation. Mole is made with ingredients of assured quality, ingredients that meet the official U.S. pharmacopoeia requirements for medical purity. So, gentlemen, try Mole. The brushless shaving cream that puts face protection first. And now back to Jeffrey Barnes and Act Two of The Beckoning Fair One. Paul Oleron, writer, had not been in his new living quarters long before strange things began to happen. Nails put themselves back into the wood. A leaking water tap played an old tune. And an invisible woman appalled Oleron's soul by combing her hair. He has just returned to his rooms after spending the night walking the streets and contemplating the beckoning fair one. I looked at the rumpled bed. The sheets bore a distinct impression as if somebody had lain on them. I knew that I hadn't been near the bed since Mrs. Grayson had made it the day before. I was face to face with it now. Something inhabited my room. But what? I was seized with a desire to know the thing, find out what it was. I lay down on the bed and tried to figure it out. It was becoming clear to me now that the key lay in my half-written novel, Romilly. Or rather, in both Romillys, the old one and the proposed new one. Looking back over it, I realized there was almost passionate hatred in the way the new Romilly had supplanted the old. And somehow, all this was related to Elsie Bendo. One thing was certain. Elsie must not come inside this house again. That afternoon, I saw her coming up the walk. I hurried to meet her outside. I'm sorry, Elsie. I, I'm just going uh, out. I've got an appointment downtown. You want to walk along with me? Paul, you haven't any appointments. You just don't want me in the house. Well, I only wanted to tell you that everything's over between us. Well, Elsie. Let me finish, I... Paul. Something strange is happening to you. Please, Elsie. But if you ever... If you ever need me, Paul, somehow I'll know it. And then I'll come. Sorry to bother you so late, Mr. Barrett, but something I've got to ask you. Oh, uh, glad to be of help, I can. Uh, yes, uh, as renting agent for the house, you'd know something about the previous tenant, wouldn't you? Uh, yes. The last tenant in your rooms was an artist by the name of Madley. He uh, seldom went out of the place. As a matter of fact, Madley died there under uh, rather peculiar circumstances. Yes? Uh, it was discovered at the post-mortem that there wasn't a particle of food in his stomach. Starved to death? No, he starved to death, all right. Only it wasn't because he didn't have any money. You see, they found a bank book in his room proving he had $10,000 in a New York bank. Suicide, then? By starvation. Hmm? It's rather an uncommon form of suicide, isn't it? Then... Then why? Why? I don't know, Mr. Oran. Nobody ever found out. <laughs> I returned to the house. That there was a strange presence there, I was convinced. And now that I'd rid myself of Elsie, Bengo, who'd been the old inspiration for the character Romilly in my novel, I hoped to meet the beckoning fair one. She who was becoming the new inspiration. Once inside... I had to be calm, convinced that I didn't care whether she appeared or not. I lit a candle in the bedroom, drew down the blind, took off my coat, and stooped to get my slippers from under the bed. I straightened up. Reflected in the mirror, I saw a gleam of light in the center of the room. It moved up and down through the air. It was the reflection of the candle on my comb. And each of its downward movements was accompanied by a silky, crackling rustle. 
I went into the living room and returned with the manuscript of the old Romilly. The combing stopped immediately. I was no longer aware of the fair one's presence. <laughs> As I thought. She's just jealous. Jealous. <laughs> Night after night passed, and still I did not see her. My life became one passionate and consuming desire to see the new Romilly, the new heroine of my novel, who had fastened herself on my brain in the guise of the beckoning fair one. Yes, sir? What can I do for you? I want a bouquet of roses. Yes, sir. Got some beauties today. Beauties for a beautiful lady, huh? Here's a nice bouquet. That one will do. Nothing like roses to win the heart of the fair one, eh? <laughs> What'd you say? Uh, uh, I was just making conversation. You said something about the fair one. Oh, just a manner of speaking, sir. I didn't mean any offense. Oh, of course not. I'm sorry. I'll take those flowers now, and I want you to deliver a bouquet of these to my house every morning for the next two weeks. <laughs> I'd made the arrangements with the florist so I wouldn't have to leave the house at all. I hoped the flowers would unbend her coy, stubborn will. They did no good. I lost track of the days. I walked through my rooms with slippered feet now, treading softly, afraid of frightening her away. I kept the windows shut and the crimson blinds down. In this enticing, flower-laden place, I waited for the beckoning fair one. searched my mind for some reason why she held herself back from me. Suddenly it came to me. The manuscript of the old Romilly, those 15 chapters. I was a fool to think that the new Romilly would show herself to me as long as there existed evidence of my former attachment. I took the manuscript from the window box and was about to throw it into the fire. No! Who's, who's there? It's Elsie. Go away. I, I can't see you now. Please let me in, Paul. No. Paul, you're in trouble. I know you are. I'm all right. Go away. Paul, I only want to help. I promised I'd come if you needed me. Paul. Paul. Please answer me. Paul. I didn't answer. Paul. She was a fool. Coming here where she was not wanted. Why didn't she leave me alone? Her voice only irritated me. Soon her calling stopped. I heard her footsteps going down the stairs. destroyed the manuscript of my old novel, Romilly, page by page. Then I lay down to wait again. How long, how many days, I don't know. I was beyond the world of calendars and clocks. Gradually, the strength drained from my body. I gazed vacantly at the star-patterned ceiling. Sometimes I had a fleeting recollection of a novel to be written... It was like something far off. Sometimes I thought about Madley, the previous tenant who had lived here before me, and I wondered... I wondered whether she had played her coy game with him. Paul. Uh, Paul. Elsie. How, how did you get in here? Paul, listen to me. You're not well, darling. Let me take care of you. Uh, I said I'd come when you needed me, Paul. Oh, wait. <laughs> she she called my name. She's she's here at last. Oh, what is it? I don't hear anything. Now, up 
here on the second floor, you've got four big rooms. Plenty of light and air. Uh, certainly a quaint-looking place. Say, isn't this the part of the house where that writer lived, the one who's being executed tonight? <clears throat> yes, yes, this is it. What was the name of that girl he murdered? Elsie Bengo. Uh, of course, it's not a new house, but we'll be glad to do the place over for you. Uh, the water tap leaks uh, slightly, but it won't bother you. And so we have heard how the strange voice of an unseen woman drove Paul Oleron to commit a murder. Yes, Mr. Barnes, the voice gave him evil advice. But now, listen to a voice that gives helpful advice. Mole, mole, mole puts face protection first. Yes, gentlemen, mole does put face protection first. It guards your face against annoying little nicks and scrapes because it's got a special protective film, a slick, smooth film with plenty of real body and substance. Mole gives your razor something to ride on. Your razor rides along smoothly from the first stroke to the last, and you get a close, clean shave without any pulling or tugging at your whiskers. You'll find that your shaves will get better, better, and better when you use M-O-L-L-E. Mole, the brushless shaving cream that puts face protection first. This is Jeffrey Barnes again, ladies and gentlemen, inviting you to be with us next week when we will bring you L.A.G. Strong's dramatic story of premeditated murder entitled Breakdown. A man is caught in the complicated web of a love triangle, which he realizes is slowly driving him insane. He attempts to solve his problem with a carefully planned murder, but it comes to a disastrous climax. So, mystery fans, be sure to listen next week to L.A.G. Strong's compelling adventure in crime... Breakdown. The original music for the Mole Mystery Theater is composed and conducted by Jack Miller. The Beckoning Fair One was written by Oliver Onions and adapted for radio by Eric Arthur. Until next Tuesday, this is Dan Seymour saying good night and good shaving with the brushless shaving cream that puts face protection first. Mole. Are Mole Hills Mountains to you? Are you too tired, too weary to face daily problems? Then listen. Doctors may find that your fatigue is caused by a borderline anemia. Yes, a borderline anemia resulting from a ferro-nutritional deficiency of the blood. Decide now to throw off depressing fatigue with the help of Iron Eyes Yeast Tablets. They're formulated to overcome borderline anemia by helping to build up red blood cells. Take IY, Iron Eyes Yeast Tablets, to get more vigor, more drive, more energy. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Mm.